we're going to talk now about debriefing. And debriefing is both a skill and an art. And we're specifically going to talk about the 3D model of debriefing that goes through the steps of diffusing, discovering, and deepening. I created the 3D model of debriefing not because there was nothing out there. I created it because I wanted to start with a good, sound foundation of theoretical principles. What happens is most debriefing models have a three-phase approach, and that's because that works. It's not that one debriefing model is better than the other, it's just the reasoning behind it. In many areas, it's just because they've done it for years and it works, and that's fine. What I'm going to do is show you how the, the 3D model debriefing takes into account the learning outcomes model, which is the individual, the experience, and the environment, and the experiential learning cycle of do, reflect, think, redo, to, in order to improve outcomes at the patient bedside through learning. The 3D model of debriefing starts with diffusing. Now, diffusing originally was from critical incident stress, debriefing and diffusing, after traumatic events. Diffusing was chosen as the first step because in the CISD world, they talk about it this way. When you have an experience, it's like you have a video camera, and the video camera freeze frames in front of you, and all you can see is that traumatic event. Well, that's what happens to our learners. You may not think about simulation as traumatic, but it is tough for them. So what we want to think about is how to get that camera rolling again. So the first question is real simple. How did that feel? That's not how did you feel that went. It's how did it feel. Now, if not everybody wants to volunteer their feelings, that's okay. But you want to give people a chance to express them. We're not doing group hugs, not kumbaya, not support group. But we want to give them a chance to do it. Now, if you do have a particularly difficult scenario, you may actually have to have psychologically trained staff to help you out. Now, the second part of diffusing is what were the facts of the case? And I like to use an SBAR format of situation, background, assessment, and recommendation so people get used to using that format in handing off patients. You can use whatever transition format you like. But I want them to see that we're all on the same page about the facts of the case. Now, if they look at it and say to us, oh, well, I thought the patient had leukemia, and the answer was, no, they were having a heart attack, well, then we're going to need to talk about the facts. But we're trying to get the facts and the feelings up front so that we can talk about the mental models of how did we get there. The mental models are identified in the second part on discovery. Now, before I go into how do we identify mental models, I'll talk just a moment about how powerful mental models are. Mental models impact the way we look at the world. The mental models are the critical thinking. And for those of you that love concept maps, that's a mental model. It's a pictorial way of showing. Well, here's what happens in concept maps. In concept maps, we draw boxes with concept in them. Then we draw an arrow that connects it to another or a line, and we label the line. The line is the connection of why. The facts in the beginning of the case, the diffusing, is the what. We want to be identifying the why. Why did the student do this? Good test for debriefing. If the student can answer your question on their phone, let them, and you ask the wrong question. That's a what question. We want to be asking why. We want to be getting a mental model. And the folks at CMS and Jenny Rudolph uh, developed this great tool on advocacy inquiry, which is a great way to get to mental models. That's outside the scope of this discussion. But I'm going to show you a different way of the five whys. The five whys actually come out of the Six Sigma Lean li literature, which is great because then it integrates with healthcare practice. And anyone that has, has kids has felt the five whys. That's just when your kid is asking so many questions over and over and over until you say, finally, because I'm the parent, I say so. So the five whys. What happened is we see an action. We see what. We don't know why. We cannot make assumptions about why. The why is the mental model. We need to be curious, truly curious about why did somebody do something. And we give the benefit of doubt that there's a really good reason. I had a great paramedic student. The paramedic student, top of his class in both skills and books. And he was precepting with me. And the way I work in my ambulance is I say, okay, go ahead, take care of the patient. I'll ask questions if there's some reason I need to shift you. And if I push you in a different direction, I apologize. You can ask your questions afterwards. We don't have that in front of the patient. So we walked into this skilled nursing facility. And I could hear down the hall a percolating coffee pot. And 
I said, oh, I know where our patient is. So I stopped at the nursing station to grab the paperwork, and my student went into it. And in EMS, we do have some trouble in diagnosing CHF versus pneumonia in the field. So I figured it was a good example for him. So I go in the room, the patient's sitting straight upright, big old swelling, pink frothy sputum, fluid coming out everywhere, having very, very difficult breathing. I said, oh, this is easy. No problem. So I asked my student, I said, what's going on? First, why? And he said, well, I think the patient has pneumonia. I said, well, we're going to treat it like a CHF, and then we're going to talk about it afterwards. So we treat it like a CHF. We sit down for our debriefing after. We did our diffusing. Second moment, we're saying, all right, what was wrong with the patient? He said, pneumonia. I said, well, we just treated him for CHF. So why you said pneumonia? He said, well, the patient was having trouble breathing at night. I said, okay, why is that pneumonia? And he says, well, I had a patient last week. By the way, that's your cue that he's giving you a mental model. I had a patient last week who had pneumonia, who had nocturnal dyspnea. And what happened was this student had actually connected the surface of the mental model, the what, rather than getting to the why, the structure. So I asked him another why. I said, Okay, well, why was this patient having difficulty breathing at night? And he sits there for a moment. And he puts out a curse word. He goes, man, that was CHF. He lays down, bubbles up fluid, and he can't breathe. Well, here's what happened. That student identified his own mental model, identified the disconnect, and shifted it in that moment. He actually did the deepening component of 3D on his own, all by asking questions. That's ideally what we'd love to see. Now, not all students can do that. One little cautionary tale. If I had, instead of asking questions about why, talked about what, that student could have recited to me all of the facts and figures and all of the signs and symptoms of CHF and pneumonia and still would have made that mistake. I saw that student five years later and he said he still used that model of trying to get to the structure and understand and it's changed his practice. So in the discovering phase, we're trying to identify someone's mental model. What we're trying to find out is, are they missing a block, a a concept, or are they missing a connection, or are they making the wrong connection? Once we've identified the student's mental model, then what we can do is start working on shifting, and that's in the deepening phase. One good exercise with this is to get the student's structural mental model and then give the instructor's structural mental model and talk about why are they different. The student saw it this way, the instructor saw it this way. Why is that different? Now we start talking about comparison. It's actually a process called analogical reasoning. Very, very powerful. Now as an instructor, that may be hard because you need to know your mental model. The hard part is instructors are unconsciously competent. They don't even know what they know. I mean, you have people that have been doing this for 20 years and they walk in the room like, patient's sick. Why? I, uh, we'll figure it out. And a new student's walking through, going through their checklist, and they are, the student is actually unconsciously incompetent. And the student's going through the checklist, and the, the instructor's like, can't you see the patient's dying? Well, the hard part is sharing each other's mental model because they're tacit. It may be useful to have somebody who's actually earlier in their career as a content expert so that you can debrief, but the content expert can share their mental models of current practice because they're more aware of them. What we're going to do in the deepening is show the disconnect and try to build a new mental model. Then what we do is the next step of deepening or diving deeper is we want to connect it to practice. Ideally, what we'd love to do is do a redo. Do a simulation that at the surface looks different, but structurally is the same. That can't always happen. So what we can do is a couple different things. One, if we have, let's say, two students going to simulation and four watching, Well, when we do another scenario with the next two students, it's a little bit of vicarious learning and vicarious redoing. You will see people picking up and when they're watching going, ah, see, they caught that. They caught that because I messed that up. That's that's a good way to do it. At least the, the mental exercise of going around the room and asking, what is the one thing you can take away from this that you could apply tomorrow is a way of doing a mental exercise of redoing. It's also a connection to practice. And what I'd like to do is 
and every class that way. So students are used to that question. In asking, what would you take away from practice, you're helping them to solidify their mental models, and hopefully they actually will try it next time in practice. Now, that sounds pretty simple. I do my diffusing, my discovering, and my deepening. But actually doing that is hard. Developing skills in debriefing takes time. You have to deliberately practice it. That means I have 10,000 hours to be an expert. And you need feedback, you need a mentor. We here at Learning and Healthcare are here to help you. We do offer faculty development courses, but what we also do offer is video-based debriefing of your debriefings. You can send us a video of the scenario and your debriefing. We will actually provide you a written and verbal feedback or debriefing on your debriefing. It is available at www.learninghealthcare.com.